guest in this segment is the Attorney General of the State of West Virginia, candidate for governor as well, Patrick Morrissey. Good morning, Mr. Morrissey. How are you? I am doing well. It's always good to hear you talk about driving and, and weather. And I could add to that because I have always found that when you're driving along Route 68 and you get through Garrett County, oh my. that you could have your worst winter during the summertime or fall as you're driving <laughs> through there. That could just be a, a horror trap. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. But oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really many, many a time. I've driven through in April and May, and all of a sudden I feel like I'm in the middle of a, a snowstorm and you can't see anything in front of you. And it's just amazing how the weather changes in that area. And it's only a few miles like that. It's just it'll be perfect, then you get five miles of that, and then it's perfect again. It makes no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well we... hope you guys are doing well. Uh, a lot of busy stuff going on, mm -hmm. but uh, hope things are well on the home front. What did you think of the first group of four getting together and having a governor's debate? Uh, what do you think? What did you think of your performance there? Look, I think overall it went well, and we were able to talk a lot about uh, the record that I have. I think that's the advantage that we have. That a lot of the other guys are going to try to take some shots or bring us down because. I'm the guy running with the record of getting a lot done, and I think the other folks are going to try to uh, cast dispersions or challenge that. But I think overall it was positive. I thought the questions generally uh, tried to bring out some uh, really different pieces of information about the candidates. Uh, so overall good, and you know, I know we're going to have at least another one coming up. So, uh, But I, I think it's important for – candidates to field the questions and get out there and just like i come on your show for how many years now and i think it's it's helpful for people to stand in the fire and uh take questions and deal with the adversity that comes along with it hey you've been doing this uh, on our program here since you got elected and we appreciate that by the way uh one one part of that you got called out and that was when you were referencing more capito's mother senator shelley capito and uh, Chris Miller called you out on that. Do you regret well, doing I, that, I Patrick? Well, I thought that was silly, right, from Chris, because I was not meaning disrespect. I was just meaning that Senator Capito had actually urged me to settle for an amount that ended up being close to half the amount that I settled for in terms of the drug settlements. And, you know, these guys are providing some inaccurate and false information. As you guys know, I think we've talked about it, there's really there's no argument that the West Virginia settlements, the state, the counties, and cities, are number one per capita in the nation. And the second-place finisher, New Mexico, is about 20% behind. And so when you have a lot of people along the way urging you to take a lot less money, including a sitting U.S. senator, for people to attack that and say, well, somehow you should have gotten more or it's a low amount, I think is ridiculous. So that was the purpose of it, to show no disrespect. It wasn't a personal attack, as you guys know, but I think it's interesting. And that's a good example of all these guys kind of weighing in, saying, oh, we could have gotten more. Like hell they could have. There's no way they would have been able to because these guys don't know the process. And it's really important that you have someone who's really good at fighting in the arena and accomplishing things. And I think that's, that's important. So I thought that was important for that to get out. I, I do hope that people go and they look at the facts. We've produced some tables that are, uh, you have some that are online in our official office, WVAGO.gov. And then obviously we have items that we put online uh, that were pulled down from the, the campaign side. So I think it's really important that people take a look and see the facts. And it's a, it's a darn good record. Uh, by the way, I need to pass this along. I just uh, got this traffic alert. Jarrodstown Road, Apple Harvest uh, Drive, multiple cars getting stuck. Avoid the area. Currently, the road is shut down. Stay out of that area. Patrick, it's better that you're in Charleston than Jefferson County this morning because we are getting pounded with wet snow this morning. It's been a, a yeah, bit of no, an adventure. Yeah, I know it's actually different here. I mean, the sun was out. But uh, trust me, I, I've been in some of the terrible traffic in the EP. I remember in 2010 being stuck up at my house on the mountain in Shannondale, and I think we had combined close to four feet of snow. You guys probably remember that. That oh, was yeah. unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Snowmageddon, right? I remember actually tunneling out from my front door to my mailbox to get the, to get, 
get them literally tunneled through the snow <laughs> to get to my mailbox. It was pretty funny. Uh, Mr. Bodwell. Did you actually think the mailman would have delivered mail? Just throwing that out there. <laughs> you, uh, you, know, you never know. That's the thing. You never know. Well, there'd have been tracks through the through the snow if you'd made it. I gotta I gotta ask a question. We uh, we were speaking earlier about the uh, the push for uh, getting cannabis legalized in West Virginia, recreational cannabis. What is your opinion on that, sir? Look, I've always been very open and supportive on the medicinal side because I think there are some people that uh, have expressed to me and they convinced me that there were some really important reasons, legitimate reasons, uh, to have that available as a tool uh, to address individuals' pain. So I've been very open on that front. In terms of the broader legalization issue, um, no, I haven't been able to get to that point yet uh, because I don't think that's what we need right now. But uh, I don't know whether that's going to move forward and, and pass this upcoming year, uh, you guys might have a better handle on that. But I think we've always distinguished between the medicinal side and the recreational side. As you're, as you're following what the legislature is working on, I know you pay attention to everything in the state. Are there any things that you want to see the legislature push through that you think will be very, are very important and you think will be very good for West Virginia? Well, I think part of this is it's a relatively slow year on the legislative side. I know they're working on a lot of important issues, but I'm really gearing up for the agenda that I'm going to be pushing uh, ideally when I'm serving as the state's next governor. And probably the biggest thing that I've been talking about out on the campaign trail is the importance of having a robust competition with all the states that we touch and then having the best tax code, the best regulatory policy, uh, the right investments in terms of infrastructure, and then also making sure that the workforce policies, licensing policies, the things that are going to really attract people to come in and move to our state, that we're competing and defeating all the states that we touch in order to drive our workforce participation and general population numbers up. I think that's the number one challenge that we have. And I'd like to see that as the focus. Uh, I'm going to be putting a lot of energy in that uh, from now until the time, hopefully, when I'm serving as the state's next governor. Uh, but it's really critical that we begin developing the, uh, the infrastructure to make something like that happen. We're going to really have to do that comparison so that we can attract a lot more people and we can win more and faster economically. So do you, uh, do you support, say, locality pay for these regions that are really getting beaten up by our, our neighboring states where our, our public workers, our teachers, our police officers are leaving in droves to the other states where they can afford to pay a lot more money? We're losing to them. Yeah, so I, I, I pointed out the example of what happens, for instance, when uh, you're trying to attract a teacher or a deputy sheriff from Loudoun County or from Washington County, and you see the huge delta between what uh, you're paying in Jefferson and Berkeley County and those neighboring counties and the importance of being able to compete. So I phrased it as building out the backyard brawl and competing economically. And that's, I think, it's important to talk about it from that perspective in, in terms of how you describe it to the whole state because I think the whole state can get behind that. We need to compete against all the states that we touch, and that applies for all regions of the state. So that's how I'm, I'm describing and framing it so that West Virginia can start to really move up in the rankings, because the circumstances in the eastern panhandle and in north central are most certainly different than the mid-Ohio Valley or uh, the Kanawha Valley or the southern coal fields. So I think it's critical that we talk about it from this competition perspective because when we do that we're going to get a lot more support for the changes that we need john gilstrap <clears throat> good morning patrick i want to peek behind the the political curtain a little bit here um mac warner was on the show yesterday and had very complimentary things to say about everyone during the debates and but his one comment was that he wished that the moderator had enforced time limits a little bit more and he felt that um, you and more capito had more time than the others. Not asking you to comment on that, 
But I'm curious, it, when you're doing the debate prep and you're preparing a debate strategy, yeah. is mic control part of that? To the the longer you can be on the mic, the 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 better off you're going to be. Is that is is that you an know, active I, consideration? I, I think that what ended up happening is that there's always a natural tendency to ask more questions for the person that's probably perceived to be leading in the race. And so I think that's part of what might have happened because a lot of people in the public polls show that we're doing well. And uh, that's what ends up happening. And you see that in the national uh, debates as well. Now, as you guys know, I don't take it for granted. I keep going out and working every single day and I'm not going to stop. So, but I, I think that's what ends up happening because as you saw at the debate, if everyone turns around and they want to contrast themselves with, with my record, well, that means there's going to be a lot of back and forth on this end. And I think that's what you saw happen. Uh, so I, I don't know. Look, there are probably ways that you can tighten up the rules and make things a little bit better. But at the same time, there always has to have the ability to allow a person who's being attacked or contrasted uh, to respond. And I thought that's what you saw the other day. Quick road note. It uh, looks like the 20 mile marker of Interstate 81 northbound and southbound now shut down due to wires coming down across the interstate. This heavy, wet wow. snow is wreaking damage throughout the eastern panhandle and messing up a lot of people's plans here. This kind of seemed to come out of nowhere here. Uh, Patrick, I want to ask you about the liquid natural gas letter that you've written. You have been co-leading with uh, Kansas, Indiana, and Louisiana, uh, 22 states uh, completely uh, involved in this. Uh, what was the purpose of uh, President Biden pausing exports of uh, liquid natural gas, and there seems to be some question as to whether he has the authority to do that or whether Congress is the body that was supposed to have the authority to do that. Yeah, so first of all, I don't think that there really is the authority to issue blank, blanket denials of these export permits, and we've argued, the states, and we co-led this effort with Kansas, Indiana, and Louisiana, that it's not lawful, it's harmful to our economy, it's certainly detrimental to our um, national security. So we've weighed in against that. And that makes a lot of sense for West Virginia to do. And you guys know we care a lot about these types of issues, uh, given what we have in our state, which gives us an opportunity to really grow economically. We're sitting on what people think is the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. When you think of Marcellus, when you think of Utica Shale, it's actually important for people in West Virginia to know that when you stop exporting uh, gas, there are huge consequences for the state, and we need to be uh, continuing that. So there were a number of us inspired to write about that and to make sure that we're keeping these exports available. And so we just don't think there's authority. You'd probably have to talk to the Biden administration about all the reasons why. I've been really disappointed with their energy policy or lack thereof, uh, because as you know, whether it's the Keystone Pipeline or the efforts to shut down natural gas and coal-fired power plants or many other topics, uh, this administration has not uh, been the same as the Trump administration or uh, the type of policies that we'd like to see, because if you could have affordable, cheap energy, that actually is one of the ways that you could knock out of the inflation that we had been seeing. And I think part of the reason why inflation started to really drive up, there are a lot of reasons for it, but part of the reason is when you started to make energy prices uh, rise and it was more scarce at the beginning of the Biden administration, I thought that drove a lot of the pain that was inflicted on the American economy. And certainly I've been weighing in strongly against that. What's the next step in that letter regarding this LNG pause? <laughs> Well, look, we're taking a look at, at that. We're considering some of the options in terms of whether we would go to litigation uh, or not. But at the beginning, we wanted to make sure that we uh, started by asking them. We, we usually do this for a lot of reasons. We ask for them to change the policies. Normally, they don't. Uh, but then we evaluate really the strength of our legal arguments and then uh, determine whether it's the right process and timing to go in and file a lawsuit. You guys know we filed many, many a lawsuit. We won many a lawsuit against the Biden administration. 
And I feel really good that when we get in the courtroom, when we file, we have a very good batting average. So uh, we're going to be taking a close look at that because I think it is important for West Virginia. It's important for the country, and we need to make sure we're educating people about it. I know you followed closely the Colorado situation and the Supreme Court arguments with President Trump on the ballots and such. Uh, and actually, you, I think you even got involved in that a little bit, too, did you not? Well, we did. We're actually uh, the co-lead nationally on the brief to try to ensure that President Trump uh, is allowed on the ballot. And we did that for a couple different reasons. If you look at the U.S. Constitution and the case law, it's clear that there are specific qualifications for when you're running for president and when you run for all sorts of offices. But for president, we know that there are some categorical exclusions for when people can't run. They, you could be excluded by term limits. You could be excluded because you're not a citizen. You could be excluded because you don't meet the age requirement. That's all included in the Constitution. But then when you want to have a state – or multiple states decide that uh, President Trump should be excluded on the basis of the insurrection clause. And these states are going to define the standards uh, by which an individual will be excluded. And there could be wildly varying uh, standards across the country. We thought that was highly problematic and added an additional criteria that was not included in the Constitution. So we've argued that uh, you cannot disqualify President Trump and that if there were to be activity pertaining to the disqualification and the use of the insurrection clause at a minimum, that would require a federal activity, federal provisions. And so we were very active in it. We co-lead and co-led that effort. And then separately, uh, I listened to that argument, good part of it last week, and I thought most of the justices were uh, on board with this approach. You have to wait until everything is finalized, but I'm hopeful that could be a 7281, maybe even a 90 uh, decision because I, I thought it was pretty straightforward. What are your thoughts on the um, immunity um, accusations or, or defense against uh, Mr. Trump? And do, wait, do you think that the, <clears throat> that the president has immunity from official actions oh. in, in office? And do governors have immunity from official actions in office? So I would say this in terms of the uh, presidential immunity, I do think that you want to provide uh, a layer of protection for people that are acting within their uh, their course of authority. So if if you're doing that, it would be absolutely wrongheaded to try to say, look, I did the best job I could when I was president. There were sometimes there are wild circumstances that arise. I mean, you could only imagine that. Maybe there's a national security dilemma and there's a no win situation that may come up for the uh, president. When that happens, you look and say, well, my goodness, uh, what would, would I have done in that circumstance? And can you really hold someone responsible for a no win situation? And I think those are the kinds of things that bother people like me and others that, you know, people talk about immunity. And I'm a believer generally you have to hold people accountable for what they do. But if you're talking about being in that position where someone is making a really tough decision, yeah, I think there should be some protection uh, for that person. I think that makes a lot of sense, and, and I've strongly supported uh, those efforts to have uh, immunity. We obviously don't have the same types of provisions or issues that arise on the state level uh, for governor because we're not dealing with some of the same type of national security or other uh, matters. Uh, that in the governor's office as we are in the uh, White House. Uh, but obviously you can still have matters where someone could file a suit and argue that you acted outside of the law. No one's really immune to that. Obviously there's generally protection for constitutional officers for the official actions that they're involved with. And the resolution for going after someone like that would probably be impeachment as opposed to uh, some of the other forms of liability when they're in office. But no one's immune uh, to accountability on the state level. But we're talking about, I think, different types of issues and challenges that occur on the state and the federal level. I think if, if a president openly 
defies and breaks a law, a serious violation of that. I don't think you can have blanket immunity. Now, you could, you could say if we look at 9-11, if the president ordered the shooting down of one of those jets before it went into the Capitol building or a city, a lot of innocent people on that plane are going to die. And you can see where it would be a bad situation to try the president sure. for murder in a situation. like. On the other hand, if I'm doing an interview with President Trump and he doesn't like the question that I ask and he pulls out a gun and shoots me in the head, he, he can't have unfettered immunity for that. It, it can't be unlimited, well, look, no, no restrictions. Of, of, I mean, of, here's of, how right? I've always looked at it. I've always thought that uh, the president should get kind of broad latitude of immunity. But look, I, of course you can find fact patterns like that where you say that someone uh, should be treated just like every other citizen. And I've always thought that one of the ways to solve this problem would be to have really broad parameters of immunity for our president because they are going to be in absolutely wild situations. You pointed out one, right, in terms of 9-11 and the Jets. And I think most people would say, yeah, I mean, you're darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. And so what do you do in that situation? And I think the answer to that really would be for the future, I'm not saying what it is now, but for the future, you might say, look, if someone is acting in a way where, you know, unless they're acting in like a grossly unreasonable way and you can't possibly put yourselves in that in those shoes, then you should provide that immunity. And I think that's the kind of standard ultimately uh, that could resolve some of these issues going forward in the future, because clearly you do want um, immunity. And you want it to exist so that you don't have the the kind of nonsensical attacks that come after people are making. Our president makes unbelievable calls every day, regardless of who's in there. You're going to have to put yourself in his shoes, and they're dealing with impossible situations. So you have to factor that in. And in my mind, uh, you know, if I were king for a day, I would say, let's set up a standard that's really, really hard Mm -hmm. uh, for someone to hold a president um, liable on the immunity side, but obviously we're no one suggesting allowing a president to go out and, and shoot someone in broad daylight and for no justification. That's that's just not appropriate. And on that note, we are just about out of time. Final word is yours, Patrick. Well, look, it's uh, great to be on with you guys today. We're always challenged with issues, whether it's about squirrels or roads <laughs> or all sorts of different uh, topics. And I'm just glad that uh, recently I've had a chance to get back to the Eastern Panhandle and we've been busy doing our day job and fighting to uh, make sure that we're defeating the federal government when they're crossing the line and they're attacking our state. And then separately, our campaign's coming along pretty well. And I'm looking forward to getting back and having a chance to seeing a lot of people in person. So thanks again for the opportunity to have me on. I'm grateful and look forward to talking with you soon. Have a great day.